Did you know that the lives of women in ancient Rome were regulated by men? Hello and welcome to World History Encyclopedia. My name is Kelly and today's video is all about the roles and lives of women in the Roman world. Don't forget, the easiest way to support us is by giving this video a thumbs up, subscribing to our channel and hitting that bell icon for notifications so you don't miss out on any new uploads. If you haven't already heard, World History Encyclopedia has teamed up with Andante Travels to bring you the Treasures of Ancient Greece guided tour. Join our expert tour guide, Dr. Rita Roussos, as she takes you on a journey through classical Athens to Delphi, across the Gulf of Corinth, and into the Peloponnesian Hills, where the hero Hercules began his 12 tasks and King Agamemnon set out to rescue Helen and capture Troy. Make sure to visit worldhistory.travel or hit the link in the description below to learn all about this amazing trip, and we hope to see you there. The exact role played by women both in ancient Rome and all throughout the ancient world is pretty obscure due to the focus of both the ancient male writers and the 19th and 20th century male scholars, who largely ignored them. It has only been recently that modern scholarship has begun working to demystify the lives of women from biased source material written by men. By looking objectively at the ancient evidence concerning women in ancient Rome, we are getting a clearer and clearer picture of their rights, duties, status, and daily lives. For most women in ancient Rome, at all times of their life, they were limited in their movements and subordinate to a male in their family, whether that be their father or male guardian or their husband. Many ancient sources focus not on young girls, but on young boys, and since Roman society was highly gendered, we can't assume that young boys and girls were treated the same, although the lives of girls and women also changed depending on their social status. Women would often marry young, sometimes before puberty, but more often around the 20 years old mark, with many girls moving straight from girlhood to marriage. And all girls were expected to marry. The pudor and castitas, modesty and chastity, were important parts of their status and reputation, since they didn't want their past sexual history to potentially humiliate their husband in the future. The senior male of the family was the head of the family and was known as the pater familias. And even the difference in male and female names showed women's subordination. Men had three names, the praenomen, nomen, and cognomen, whereas all the women in a family were simply referred to as the feminine version of the family name. When a woman married, they would either keep their maiden name or be referred to instead by their husband's name. Marriage was not a romantic affair, and a husband and a wife weren't necessarily expected to love each other, but they were expected to have children. The wife would then attend to the home, work on crafts, and if they were in the upper class, they may study subjects like philosophy and literature. Women would be in charge of the care of their children, although elite women left much of the care of their children to nurses and servant caregivers. Women were highly dependent on men and had to nominate a male family member to act in their interest in matters of law. There was an exception to this though for women with three children, after circa 17 BCE, freed women, and vestal virgins. According to Roman law, females and males had equal property rights, so the property may be split up between sons and daughters. But actual Roman families may not have followed the law in this particular area. Of course, there are always exceptions, and we do have evidence of women running their own financial affairs, running estates, and owning businesses. And this was often the case when the male head of the family died on military campaign. In order to differentiate between married women and other women in the highly stratified Roman society, there was even a specific dress, the stola, which was a long tunic worn by married women underneath an overdress, which was not worn by any other women, like prostitutes, slaves, or unmarried women. There was a view in ancient Roman society that women had weak judgment, an idea advanced by Cicero, which suggested that women were unable to manage affairs like property for themselves. 
But Roman law did say that a wife's property, except her dowry, was to be kept separate from her husband so she could reclaim it after a divorce. Divorce was actually quite easily achieved by both men and women, but if there were any children from the marriage, they belonged to the father. In the later Roman Empire, and particularly after the legislation implemented by Constantine, divorce became much more difficult, especially for the woman. Women were pretty restricted in public life. They couldn't attend, speak at, or vote in political assemblies, and they couldn't hold any position of political authority. Some women were able to influence public affairs through their husbands, but this wasn't too common. Lower class women had more of a public life since they had to work for a living, with common jobs undertaken by women being in agriculture, markets, crafts, as midwives or as wet nurses. Some places women were allowed to attend though included the theatre, public spectacles including gladiatorial games, and Roman public baths. Some women in fact participated in the games at the Colosseum as gladiators, and although they might become celebrities, they were still looked down on as lower class. To distinguish between what the Roman males would consider a respectable woman who was honourable and chaste, and those that were not, women who lived as prostitutes wore a toga rather than the stola. There was no third category, women were seen as either honourable or not, and this view made men hypocrites for insisting that their female relations had to be moral and chaste while simultaneously spending their time with lovers, married or unmarried, and prostitutes. Not only was there the physical demarcation with the differences in dress, but lower class women and prostitutes had even fewer rights than higher class women, with prostitutes and waitresses being unable to prosecute for rape, and the rape of slaves seen simply as property damage. There are small hints of women who found a way to live their life beyond the confines that male writers have made so clear, and one way was as writers. An example of this is Sulpicia, the only female Roman poet whose work has survived from the 1st century BCE. We have love poems written by Sulpicia addressing her boyfriend, a youth she calls Cerinthus, which was almost definitely a pseudonym since it was clear her family didn't approve of him. In her poems, she expresses her desire to be with her love, but later poems tell us that he was unfaithful, and we can only assume she ended up being married to someone chosen by her father. Even though she probably wound up in a traditional arranged marriage, not for love as she'd hoped, she was still able to find a way for self-expression and empowerment. Women were pretty restricted in public life, but a place they were allowed to participate was in the religion of ancient Rome. There were public state priestesses who performed rites and divination, and both upper class and lower class women took part in household rituals that worshipped family ancestors, lares and penates, the guardians of the household. Women could participate in so-called mystery cults that were only open to them, such as the cult of Bonadea, good goddess, which allowed women to drink wine in excess, perform sacrifices, and participate in other rites that were usually barred from. One of the most important roles for a woman in the religion of Rome was that of the Vestal Virgins, who were associated with the cult of Bona Dea. The Vestal Virgins were priestesses of the Roman deity Vesta, the goddess of the hearth, and there would have been either four or six priestesses employed to keep the sacred fire at the Temple of Vesta alight, as well as perform other rites associated with the goddess. Roman girls were chosen as Vestal Virgins between the ages of six and ten years old. If chosen, they had to remain chaste for the minimum of 30 years they had to dedicate to the goddess. A Vestal Virgin, once chosen, was removed from her family and became legally independent. During their 30 years as a Vestal Virgin, many of the women became very wealthy. After the 30 years, they were free to marry if they wanted, but very few chose to. There were some serious punishments for failing in one's duties, and especially for losing one's virginity, like beatings, being buried alive, or having molten lead poured down one's throat. 
It's interesting to note that unlike in ancient Greek mythology, where women were created later and secondary to man in the form of Pandora, who brings unhappiness, pain and illness to Earth, the Romans were far more neutral. Ovid in his Metamorphoses doesn't specify whether it was man or woman who was the first human. And unlike the Greeks, men and women weren't regarded as separate species. Although they seem to have this neutral view of the creation of man, one of the early famous episodes in Roman mythology is anything but neutral. Romulus, the legendary founder and first king of Rome, finds himself in a city with his men, but which is lacking in women. And so these early settlers of what would become Rome invite neighbouring tribes to visit, and then they abduct their women and make them their wives. This episode, known as the Rape of the Sabine Women, truly reveals much about the Romans' view of women. Even elite women, those in the higher echelons of society, were restricted from the political and military spheres of ancient Rome. But those in the imperial family often used their male relatives to their advantage. With an emperor came a mother, sisters, wives, and even daughters, who used their political connections to wield significant power and political influence. Although there are examples of exceptional women as empresses and mothers of the emperor in the Roman Empire, even these women were unable to reign in their own right and could not be empress without an emperor. For example, there was Agrippina the Younger, who was the power behind the throne of the young Emperor Nero, and Julia Domna, who was the wife of Emperor Septimius Severus and the mother of the Emperor Caracalla. Julia was a patron of the arts, she was a priestess in Surya, travelled to Britain, and after her son became emperor, she was given the title Mother of the Senate and of the Fatherland. So there were ways in which women could be the equal or superior to men, but this was rarely openly acknowledged. Can you think of any other women in Roman society who rose above their limitations to do extraordinary things? Let us know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on our new videos every Tuesday and Friday. This video was brought to you by World History Encyclopedia. For more great articles and interactive content, head to our website via the link below. World History Encyclopedia is a non-profit organization and you can find us on Patreon, a brilliant site where you can support our work and receive exclusive benefits in return. Your support helps us create videos twice a week. So make sure to check it out via the pop-up in the top corner of the screen or via the Patreon link down below. Thank you so much for watching and we will see you soon with another video.